Welcome to the Further North Podcast, your weekly dose of the North Melbourne Footy Club. My name is Josh and this is a fan-run podcast doing match previews, reviews and everything North. Let's get it started. Hello North Faithful, welcome back to Further North. And we're going to get some absolute podcasting royalty back on. You probably already know who it is, probably by the title of this video or the thumbnail, but Marnie is going to be coming back and joining us in just a second. I will let you guys know we did have to do it over Zoom. The game, obviously, prime time at Marvel, 4.40 um, on a Sunday afternoon. Fantastic, but unfortunately, Marnie didn't have the time to leave the game, come all the way out here record, then go home, which is completely understandable. So we did do this one over Zoom. Uh, apologies for any of the crackly audio and it not being quite as crisp as usual, um, but I really did want to get Marnie back on because you guys really loved when she was on here last time. So I'm going to throw over to that now. Apologies for any little crackles or it was a tiny little bit of a delay, but look, it's still a great chat with Marnie like always. And um, yeah, we are going to plan next time she's going to come back out and we're going to do it in person again. But uh, thank you for sticking through the audio not being quite as good. I appreciate it a lot. And uh, here's Marnie. So we've welcome, we're welcoming Marnie back onto the podcast today, um, fresh off uh, a thrilling encounter at Marvel Stadium. You were there. I wasn't. Um, I guess first up, give me your emotions and, and, your, and your thoughts after that performance. I'm devastated. Like, I think any normal, like, reaction for, like, the knee-jerk reaction is, like, heartbreak. Like, to yeah. lo- like we were in that game, you know, as soon as we got ourselves into the game and we showed up 15 minutes into the first quarter, we, mm. we just, it was our, I think it was our most complete performance of the year. Um, and I think yeah. we missed, you know, Simkin went off early, concussion, Greenwood went off Greenwood, at half time, yeah. concussion. I was heartbroken from that. I alone. know you would have been. I was devastated. I'm walking around Marvel <laughs> Stadium with my Jasper Pittard badge on, who doesn't play for the club <laughs> anymore. Hugh Greenwood's injured, gone off concussed. I'm walking around. There's no reason for you to show up. I mean, you know, I just do it for the love of the team, you know? <laughs> um, but I just, oh, I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's heartbreak and it's disappointing. But then, you know, once you sit with the emotion for a while and you actually think, <clears throat> holy shit, like that was a that was a that was a performance and a half. And that yeah. was and that was the effort and the heart that's in that, you know, you can't question that. No, absolutely. And that's that's the thing for me when the when the siren went at the end, I was genuinely unhappy. But I didn't know why I was unhappy because there was so many positives to take from the game, just like there has been the last few weeks, but it's really, it's taken me the last, you know, couple of hours to try and understand what's going through my head where I'm like, I'm upset about the result, but I'm happy. And I didn't expect to win, but I thought we could win. And maybe my brain hasn't compartmentalized that just yet. I think we spoke about this before the game. We spoke and we said that, you know, we think that North are actually a, a, a shot here to win this game. Shot, I think yeah, yeah. for me, it's it's heartbreaking and it's disappointing, but it's I'd rather sit in emotion like this than sit in an emotion after a game we've been belted by another, it's another 10, 12, 13, 15 goal loss. It's true. And you sit there and it's despair and it's like, where are mm. we going and what's going on? Like, like to be here like we won our first mm. two games of the year and that's obviously, you know, and then we, we played okay against Hawthorne and then we played okay against Carlton. And we've had, you know, a few games in there that have just been, you know, these blowouts. So to kind of get to where we are now, twelve just mm. 12 rounds into the year, I think overall, like, and again, once you sit with the disappointment, because at the end of the day, football's about winning and losing. Mm. And you want to win a game no matter where you are on the ladder, no matter what happened the week before, All's fair in love and war when you you get out on the field. And maybe it wasn't last week against Collingwood or maybe it wasn't when we played Port Adelaide because it's the top two teams on the ladder. 
But yeah, I yeah. think the way we've played the last three weeks shows us that we actually are a chance pretty much every week if we show up and play like that. Yeah. No, and that's I, I not agree. something I would have said confidently like 12 months ago. You know? No, well, even even after those first two wins, that's a good that's a good point to touch on because it's like the first two wins we were all on uh, cloud nine. The first two weeks we were just like, has Clarko turned this thing around this quickly? But and I think we'd all agree that the last three weeks we've played so much better than when we won those two games. Like those two games were just fought to the death clunky football, kick and hope, and it just fell our way. But the last few weeks we've played good football and we haven't quite got the result, but I reckon we should have won two out of the three of those games. We should have. And we, if we play like this for the rest of the year, we will win at least two hmm. to three more games, I think. I really Absolutely. believe that. And, you know, I just – and I think it's 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 one thing I think a lot of people will sit here and say, well, it's the – caretaker coach effect we've seen this one before but it's this is Clarko's system this is something that he's implemented this is not a caretaker coach that's stepping in because the coach has been sacked this is something that Clarko's implemented that Ratton's obviously got a clear frame of mind to be able to implement and this is like the this is the this is the the result so Mm. He didn't turn things around quickly in the first two weeks. Okay, maybe it was a bit of a sugar hit and maybe the victory lap was, you know, came to an end after the two weeks, as Kane Corn said. But this here, it's 12 weeks and this is where we've come compared to where yeah. we've been. Mm. This is this is the fruits of Clarko's labour. The man's a genius. Like whether people want to oh, yeah. sit here and say, whether people want to say he is or isn't or whatever, or maybe it's something, you know, it's rotten, it's emotion, it's the kit. It's not. It's actually not. No, it's it's not. just someone has a clear vision to execute yeah. the plan, which is something that Clarko wasn't able to do. We only learned when he when he stood down a few weeks ago. So yeah. bloody hell. So still oh, to I come know. this far, to come this far in 12 weeks, I still think is a remarkable effort. That's the thing to remember though, isn't it? And that's the thing I remember saying after the Gold Coast loss. I, I I was so angry and disappointed that we didn't win that game because I thought we we should have, or going into it, I thought we we're better than the Gold Coast. And um, I had to sit there and remind myself that that was only six weeks into Clarkson's era at North. And now obviously we've got Ratten, but he is implementing Clarkson's game plan, like you said. And I don't know, it's almost like we had this little, this high or this rush we dropped, we had to find ourselves again, but we're actually now building a foundation. There's actual substance to what we're doing week in, week out now, not just a, a moment where we get we come to a game and we just show up and then the next week we get belted again. It's consistency. And I think that's a, a much better foundation to build off. Once a win comes, I feel like we'll be able to pull off so many more wins and the team will be so much more confident. We, and we might see it, you know, really improve drastically quickly like everyone says it can but uh, I think it's a bit of a mental block at the moment for the team just getting over the line but I didn't think today that we um you know I don't think we crumbled under pressure I don't think we got nervy I know we'll talk about uh Jack Zebel a little bit uh in the in the <laughs> positives and negatives section but um <laughs> I don't know I I think that we we've held up really well against a lot of pressure and we don't crumble like we did even just four weeks ago against Port Adelaide. Yeah, we're definitely running our games a lot better. It's something I've noticed. Um, I mm. thought that I noticed last week, you know, we played Collingwood, and I think 12 months ago, that's a game we would have lost by 15 goals. Like yeah. Collingwood, you know, they kind of took the foot off the accelerator a little bit and fair enough. They'd done all the hard yards up into three-quarter time. And rather than North just, you know, bow down and roll over and just let Collingwood continue their mm. run, they actually fought back and they cut the margin. They've done that a few times this year. They obviously did that. They did that today. They did that against Sydney. Did that against Carlton as well. Um, we ran out yep. the game quite strongly as well. We only, Even the Hawks. Know, so, the Hawks was the same as well. Yeah. So it's these are little things. and. Um, we're, st- we're, we're still predominantly a young side and there are going to be games where, we, where, you know, we're on the receiving end of a hiding or two. But we're not alone in that. Every team, most teams in the competition will go through that at some point during a season. So I Absolutely. think for us, we just need to, I think we need to, 
And I don't want to get this confused. I saw something on Twitter earlier, which I which really caught my eye. I don't want to get this yeah. confused of being with accepting a loss and taking on this loser mentality. Because at the end of the day, no one wants to lose. Mm. I don't want to. I'm not going to the football every week thinking, "Oh, gee, I hope we put in some effort today." But I'm okay with losing. Yeah. I'm far from yeah. okay. I'm far from okay with losing. What I'm sick of is coming to the football week in, week out and watching the club get belted by 10, 12, 15 goals. Yeah, so yeah. if we're losing, this is the way we're doing it. We're getting close. We're challenging teams. We're putting in a four-quarter fight and it's a fair effort. And if we're not good enough at the final siren, then so be it. But this is what we needed to see with the change of the guard and with Clarko coming in. This year was going to be all about improvement. And you can see it unfolding in front of your eyes every single week. And one day yeah. we're going to be good enough to get the Absolutely. four points. And like you said, Josh, it's going to be it's going to be a bit of belief. We've got to start believing that we're good enough to win those games, and we will, and the wins will come. So yeah, I think absolutely. that's just that's what you got that's what you got to put it down to I think at the end of the day but yeah it was probably for me that was the performance of the year that was better than Sydney yeah. that was better even better than the two wins that we had at the start of the year I think that yep. was a really cracker performance both mm. the fact that we played really well but given the circumstances as well you know given you know the key personnel that we lost early on in the game um, yeah. I think it's really important to point that out too. Do you think we'll uh, do you think we'll ever see Jai Simpkin and Luke Davies Uniac play a game together for the rest of the year? Yeah, I think we will. I think they'll both be in the side after the bye. So obviously Simpkin concussed. He misses next mm. week. The following week is the bye. Yeah. Same with Greenwood's concussed. He won't play next week either. Then the following week is the bye. LDU's close. I wouldn't rush him. There's only one game now no. before the bye. So I would see, I would hope to see all three of them back in the side. I think we played the Bulldogs mm. the first week back off the bye, so I'd like to see all okay, three yeah. of them. I'd like to see all three of them back in the side by that time. Yeah, it's – I don't know. I think we've had such an unlucky run with key players at at key points. But, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a hard one to toss up because, for me, I'm 50-50. If we, if we play LDU next week, I, I would – if we were playing someone like the Pies, I would be like, just rest him. But going down to Tassie and playing the Giants next week, if we if we turn up and play like that against the Giants, we beat the Giants in Tassie next week. Yeah, and I think next week's three a weeks big of great shot. Together. Mm. Yeah, big shot for a win next week. Absolutely. But that's the thing. Do you put LDU in maybe a little bit prematurely when you do have the bye next week? Because that is a chance at a win. I kind of say yes, but it's a cautious yes. Well, look at who played in that midfield today and the way they well, played. Mm, Do we yeah, even? I, that be... is the most. I can't believe I have the arrogance to say this after for that performance. <laughs> no, say it, say it. And after still <laughs> sitting here two and ten, <laughs> do we actually like? Is it like? <laughs> It's hard because we actually got obliterated in the center of the ground today, and that's something that doesn't happen often. So yeah, yeah, and so yes, we probably do need him to come back. But is it worth risk? It's just it's the is the risk going to be worth the reward? Obviously, it's high risk. Yes, I think it's a really winnable game next week. So yes, I mm. think the risk is worth the reward. But he's been in. This is the second time he's done his ham hamstring this year, and he's been out of the side with injury. So is that yeah. worth it? That I'm not that you've got to talk Long up. term, no, but I think that one win could could give us so Change much everything. confidence. It could. Yeah, it legitimately it could. could. You can see, obviously, we saw uh Luke McDonald after the game, you know, how emotional he was. You like how much he wanted that win. And imagine if they did get that win, plus the form that they're playing in. I don't know. I I don't know. I, I'm I'm conflicted, and this is what we were saying before. I'm conflicted about so much with North right now because, you know, everyone outside of the North community just sees the results and maybe doesn't know what's happening right now, but we all see it. And it's like it, it, kind of what you said before. We know that they're playing well and they're building something and it's getting better, but we don't go to the football to watch them play well and still lose. And, you know, they've still got the time. They're still young and it's only been 12 weeks, like you said. So this season's probably that season where we're not going to win many, but if we can put this form together through the back half of the year, get a couple of good recruits, 
in Morph Clarkson when he comes back and his game plan, we might explode next year. Who knows? But I don't know. It's it's conflicting. Do you know what I mean? Totally. If he's 100% play him, but if he's sort of like, if there's any question about his yeah. form, I wouldn't play him. You could do what they did to um, Shields. To, what's the uh, Dylan Shields? Uh, that's it. Not not our, our Liam Shields. Because um, they only played him for, what was it, like three quarters, then tactically subbed him off. So, yeah, I we could maybe do something like that with LDU. But, yeah, I'm completely split if it's worth it. But I, I say go for it. I don't know. Imagine if we got the win. I think, oh. yeah. There's no, no harder questions surrounding North me. Melbourne right now. Do you play LDU against the Giants in Tassie? Oh, God. I mean, yeah, All if right. he's up for it, play him. <laughs> we'll go to the normal structure because we've just gone on a big North rant about the game, but that's what we love. So what happened with the team? Uh, we got it announced on Thursday and was finalised on Friday. Um, obviously, the ins were Darcy Tucker, Liam Shields, Taryn Thomas, which is a good one to talk about. Um, and the outs were Daniel Howe, Tom Powell, Paul Curtis, and Charlie Lazaro. A couple of talking points there, I guess. Um, Tom Powell being dropped. He was the sub. Um, how did you feel about Tom Powell getting dropped? I don't think he deserved. I don't think that was warranted. Um, and no. I think that his game today when he did come on kind of backed that up a little bit. Yeah. I thought he was really good today. Yeah, I thought yeah, and obviously he got a lot of uh he got a lot of opportunity with Greenwood going off, you know, pretty halfway through the game. But I mean, I'm trying to think of what Tom Powell did today. I think he's he's that player that doesn't stand out for me, but he'll get to the end of the game and he'll have racked up 23 touches or something like that. The only thing I remember was when he picked the ball up in the middle and he spun the dude and was it, was oh it Draper God, he spun? Oh, my God, when he took on Draper, was? I will have yeah. that on replay for the rest of the year. Yeah, Draper absolutely. Just, he just froze. And Tom Bounds yeah. came straight at him, spun out of trouble and off he went. Yeah, That absolutely. was outstanding. I think Tom Powell's mm. a very underrated asset in the side. I agree. I agree. I think in that midfield pecking order, he's probably not, he's not near the top of that list. But him being maybe our fifth best midfielder means we're building a very solid midfield going forwards. And that's the sort of depth that we don't have in other areas that is important. Um, Daniel Howe getting dropped. I don't hate seeing Daniel Howe get dropped, but I also kind of don't think it was, you know, nah, necessary. I thought he was kind of okay last week, but nah, it doesn't feel good to say. Was. No, no, he was okay, but for me, I don't think there's, like, for me, Daniel Howe's not in our best 22. I think he comes no, in to no. fill a need when required, mm. so he could play well, but still make way for somebody else to come yeah. in. You know what I mean? I, I agree. I agree. I don't think he's he's not long-term. He's not going to be part of our next, you know, finals run or anything like that, so... Yeah, Darcy Tucker came back, which I think is good. He's a good, solid player. I thought he had an okay game. Um, I actually thought he was one Liam of our best Shields. today, Darcy Tucker. Yeah, yeah, he was I thought, solid. I, I um, thought I thought he played really well. I think he's slotting in nicely. He's not quick, um, which is a bit of an issue because not we don't have a lot of speed in our side. But I think yeah. the way he uses the ball, I think he's a smart ball user. I think he's pretty composed. Um and I thought today he he made a he made a really big impact. Yeah, no, of course. Um, there was one incident which I've written down in my positives and negatives here with a couple of players, but I think Darcy Tucker was the first one to do it. A lot of our players seem to like to try and fend. I think we do the most fend offs in the league, North Melbourne. Every player seems to like <laughs> to fend off. We start running, and then we get tackled, and no one like must say kick the ball. I think Taron had one today. Uh, Steve-O may have had, Griffin Logue had one. Every week this happens to us. It's not a an awfully bad thing for the team, but I just noticed it in the last, uh, the, well, maybe all season, to be honest. We love a fend-off and I we often get caught after do. doing it. I think the only two players in our side that have the licence to fend off whenever they please is Cam yeah. Derha and Paul Curtis. Paul Curtis. And Wardlaw when he gets wanna... a little bit more. That guy's going to do that for fun. Oh, my God, George Wardlaw. 
Well, we'll talk that's, about that's, Warlow. We've got a whole segment on him. We're going to yeah, gush. Yeah, I was going to say, he could, be, <laughs> he could be the entire positive segment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other in, we'll obviously, was uh, Taron Thomas. Uh, a controversial one, I guess, but I don't know. I think most North fans in the last couple of weeks, I think North Melbourne did a really good job of like slowly implementing him as in telling the fans and the media that he's probably coming back and it sort of like slowly was heating up. And then when he came back in the side, I don't think anyone was surprised. He got a few boos, which I'm sure is going to happen for a little bit, but I don't know. I, I Politics and off-field stuff aside, I was so happy to see him back in the team just from a talent perspective. And he was outstanding. And mm. you just don't re- you just don't remember. Well, you do know how much you missed him because we know what he could produce. Yeah. But, oh my God, we've missed him. Mm. His skill is on another level. That one-handed mark on the wing when he held that guy oh. off. I can't remember who it was on the wing, and he took it one hand. He did butcher the disposal after that, but it'll come first game back. But um, but yeah. Other than that, that uh, Charlie Lazaro went out of the team. I don't think any of us really care about that. He's one of those players that's just kind of not up to it. So yeah, pretty uh, pretty decent changes. I don't think anyone can argue too much. I mean, we're all sort of screaming for like, bring Cooper Harvey in. I'd love to see Jackson Archer in, but realistically, when I take my Archer and Harvey name fanboy cap off, uh, probably not quite ready, especially when the team's been playing that well. No, I agree with you. I think the ins and outs are really good um, this week. And I think that all of those players who came into the side really played a key role. I think mm. I just want to touch on Liam Shields. I don't know if we're going to get to him later, but he was moved on to Zach Merritt. Um, Zach mm. Merritt at quarter time. Zach Merritt had 16 touches, a yes, couple he goals did. to quarter time. Like, he was just on fire. He was Everywhere. completely unstoppable. Um, I thought that – and Shields was moved on to him at, half, at quarter time. I think he did a great job. Um, mm. I don't think enough will be spoken about it during the week, but I think his sort of shut down role. Merritt was still good. He ended the day with 30 on touches, but I think, um, yeah, I think Shields really minimised his impact and had a really, a really solid day himself. So I think he was yeah. excellent. And I really, I've loved having him um, as yeah, part of, you know, in our side this year. I think he's definitely part of the best 22. Um, I think yeah, he's yeah. been excellent. So yeah, I just agree. thought his game was, um, his game was very good today. Mm. So we'll get into the positives and the negatives. Uh, positives first. We'll keep Let's it upbeat. Um, and then these are sort of kind of in chronological order. I just jot them down while I'm watching the game. So hopefully we can relive some stuff that happened through the game with these dot points as well. But um, Let's go. the first positive I, I wrote down was in the first quarter, obviously. Um, we took our chances when we got them. And obviously Essendon came out of the blocks pretty quick. We got absolutely dominated out of the middle in the, in the first quarter. But we were very efficient in the first quarter going inside 50 and kept within touching distance, which obviously helped play out in the game. But yeah, I thought we were good at taking opportunities when we did get it into the forward line, especially early. I think so too. Our scoring efficiency was really good for most of the day and our accuracy as well. We played St Kilda a few weeks ago and oh, there, was, yeah. <laughs> there was just misses all across the board. And that is a bit of a, it's a bit of an energy thing, I think. I think if one or mm. two players miss, then, it's a mental thing. you know, a few others do. Exactly. And it kind of builds up. I was worried that was going to happen with Larky because he missed a couple early and I thought, oh, no, yeah. he's not on today. But he kind of worked his way back into the game, which was um I thought that was awesome. Zerha when he kicked, when he had that shot in the last quarter as well. I was like, Zerha loves butchering a, a shot at goal, but he was... Um, and we'll touch on Zerha as well, but um, yeah, I was worried for Zerha. I back Larky into kick nearly every shot he he does, and you yeah, know he doesn't miss classic, many. He doesn't miss many, and it's weird because he goes against. He's not doing those stupid snap kicks, which, to be fair, in the in the AFL this year, it, it's baffling me. A little bit of a boomer comment from me right now, but I remember a few years ago when Jason Dunstall was getting really angry about all the dribble kicks. And I was kind of like, oh, it is what it is. Dribble along the ground, run it through the goals, whatever. This year, with all the players snapping the ball, Harry Mackay had one on Friday night where he snapped the ball on a slight angle from like 40 metres out and didn't make the distance. And I don't understand what's going on with the game right now where that's coming into, yeah. into play. And the thing with Larky is 
typically when you you're a key forward and you're having a set shot with a drop punt, you kick through the ball and Larky never kicks through the ball. He stabs at the ball and that's usually a no, no when it comes to set shots, but it works so well for him. And I, I'm surprised no one's ever really picked that up because I remember watching Drew Petrie kick the ball and he nearly kicked the roof off, uh, off Marvel stadium. Every time he, he put his boot through (laughs) one because there's photos of him with his foot, like a meter above his head, but lucky has got a very different action, but like Ben Brown, um, it doesn't matter what your action is as long as it goes through the sticks. Close to the middle, that's all we're concerned about. Yeah, I thought um, I thought he was great today, Larky. Though he kind of came back, mm. um, got, came back into the game. So no, I do agree with you. Efficiency was good, accuracy was good, and I think that really like helped with you set the tone mm. for the game. Yeah. Um, I think he as well in that last quarter. He took a mark like 30 metres out uh, and then handballed to Sheasel instead of going back and taking the set shot. And as you key forward, you you have to be going back and taking that set shot. I know Sheasel absolutely should have kicked it and he didn't, but go back and take the set shot. You're the, you're the best forward on this team. You're one of the best set shots in the league. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's uh, sometimes some, I, I get it, like the team thing, the unselfish thing. But sometimes you have to be a bit selfish. And yes, Sheasel should have kicked the goal. But someone like Nick Larky in a situation like that has every right to be selfish to go back and take the kick. Absolutely. You know, so you've got to you, and, and I'm all for doing the team thing and and all that. But sometimes you've got to know when is the right time to be selfish, and that was the moment. No, very true. Um, Phoenix Spicer, Phoenix Spicer had nine tackles and they were real tackles. Not like last week, Phoenix Spicer, where he was holding someone's arm and they just dropped the ball and he was just getting carried by, but he had real tackles, nine tackles. That was the best game he's played. One thing I will say with Phoenix Spicer is he still isn't kicking goals. So he is... Kane Turner-esque. I know we like Phoenix Spicer, but he's putting a lot of pressure on and that was his best game I've ever seen him play, but still zero goals. So I don't want to get too excited, but um, he had a very good game. I thought, I I agree. I thought that he was really good and obviously, you know, the improvement is evident, the nine tackles, um, but he's not kicking goals. And the comp- for me, his confidence is growing, but very, very slowly. He's also like, you know, sometimes he won't just kick into, you know, if he's got the ball, he won't kick in, you know, try and kick into the forward line, try and hit up a target. He'll like kick backwards and like get someone else to do it. I think yeah. time's going to start ticking because we picked up this guy, um, Robert, Robert Hanson Jr., Jr. We picked him up in the mid-season draft. They're a like-for-like player, but Robert Hansen Jr. looks like he has no problem kicking goals. It's the same thing when Combin went down. Now, we really miss Combin's pressure inside the forward 50. I'm not not questioning that. I'm also not questioning that, that, you know, he's a really great, you know, he he presents up the ground. He provides a great option. But Callum Coleman-Jones is marking everything. Callum Coleman-Jones is kicking goals. My guy, Callum Coleman-Jones. That's what we're missing, right? Like, yes, mm. I think Combin had started to prove he started to really show something when he had a few games under his belt. But then you bring in Coleman Jones and look at the impact yeah. he's had in the f- past few weeks that he's been there since Combin's gone out. Having this conversation with my dad and brother when we were walking home um, to the car after the game. And he said, my brother said, oh, Combin, you know, what happens to Coleman Jones? Coleman comes straight back into the side. I said, Combin doesn't come straight back into the side. I, Coleman I Jones agree. is offering... Coleman Jones is offering more now than what Combin was. And that's my yep. one fear with Phoenix, right? Is that you've got to play him. You've got to get him. You've got to give him a consistent time in the side to work up his confidence. I totally get that. And I'm not saying that Robin Hanson Jr. gets off a plane on Friday from Perth and waltzes into the side on Sunday to play the Giants. That's not what I'm saying. But if he's going to start playing VFL and he's going to get a few runs on the board, he's going to start showing form. That puts pressure on Phoenix. And if Phoenix can't take that next step and start hitting Mm. the scoreboard, then his spot in the side is in jeopardy. Because now you've got Marnie's on the long-term injury list, so he doesn't play for the rest of the year. 
I don't think Kane Turner plays for the rest of the year if ever no. again. Because at this rate, he's giving the same output that Spice is giving. So I'd rather give Spice or hit at it. But this guy now coming in, in Hanson Jr., if he starts showing some form in the VFL, that puts pressure on Spicer. So, yes, I was happy with his game today, and I'll give him a tick because I thought he was excellent. But you've got to take the, you've got to start looking at perspective. I think he's got to start – he's really got to start showing more, and he's got to start hitting the yeah. scoreboard. Absolutely. Um, I did say to the – I messaged the close to a flag guys after the game, and I did say – it's genius from Clarko because uh, strategically drafting Robert Hansen Jr. To, uh, to to make sure that Phoenix Spicer performs next game was a brilliant move. Totally. Um, genius. So I think, genius. Yeah, exactly. This is the coaching that we needed. Totally. Thinking outside All the right. square. Um, Taron Thomas's first game back. Let's talk about that. What did you think about Taron Thomas and his return? Yeah, like I said before, I thought he was superb. I think he mm. didn't look like he, he did not look like he had missed a beat for me. Um, I thought he, was he very slotted. Good, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah, he slotted back in seamlessly. That goal that he kicked on the run was outstanding. Yep. Um, I thought that, yeah, he's just, his execution, like that is something that we, like, we're really missing. And of course, it's always, it's, it's going to, it's going to, there's going to be this cloud hanging over him for the next six weeks. He's got a court date in July. Um, yeah, and I think we'll probably like we'll learn what happens, you know. Then you know after that, and it could very well be that this is the last six weeks of his AFL career. Like honestly, we don't know. But right now, you the club, he's done everything the club's asked him to do. Like we were talking about when we caught up last, like it's the timing for me. I'm still a little bit like how we got here so quickly from when we were so far away eight weeks ago. But yeah. I mean, what more can you do? But the the club are the ones who are implementing this program. The club are the one that have, the ones that have always said, yep, he's all good to go. He can play. So you back him in, you play yeah. him. And he, I thought he was bloody brilliant. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I guess that's the thing. You'd hate to get him to, to hit some of his best form and then the whole court date thing sort of, you know, takes him away from the side. That would hurt us a lot. And, look, I, I hope, you know, I, I hope he does turn everything around and stays in the team and the court issue doesn't affect his career as long as all the outcomes are the right outcomes of what they should be. But I don't know. I think for a young guy to, to be able to come back in the team, perform well, on the field, it's something that hopefully would make him turn his life around and his his attitude off the field. And hopefully, it's not a last chance sort of thing for him. Hopefully, this is a a platform to build off, go and have a long career, be a better man, and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, look, if he does that on the field every week, I'll be very very happy and show some of that twenty twenty one form that he had as well. Totally. And the way, you know, he kicked that goal and the way the like his teammates just came from everywhere to get around him. I think it's I think it's important. I think if we're gonna if we've gone through this process and the club said, Yes, you've ticked all the boxes, you can play, we've got to get behind him. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's not just not just for not just for his football career, but for his life. He's a young guy, he's twenty two years old. He's got his whole mm. life ahead of him. Absolutely. You know, yeah. so I think if this is if this is where the clubs de- you know the clubs come forward and said yep he's good to go, then I think we need to you know get get behind him and to at least support him on field, and mm. you know hope that this is the start of a new chapter for him. No, absolutely. I was surprised with how many midfield minutes he got for his first game back as well. No, and, um, I I think. Sorry. No, I was going to no, say, no, I think you go. he, um, sorry guys, I'm muting because I'm coughing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Zoom just, is I'm not to. Uh... Guys, no, you can't, I'm coming off a really bad cold for those who can't hear it in my voice. And so I'm muting and coughing. So Josh is having to fill in. I'm trying to fill in the, the gaps here, guys. <laughs> I haven't used Zoom to do a podcast for, for a couple of years and, uh, 
Look, obviously, if we could have done it in person, we would have. Uh, stupid Marvel 440 kickoffs on a Sunday don't uh, allow that to happen. But um, No, exactly. Look, so it's, apologies. Uh, we'll battle through this one, guys. We'll battle through this one. We've got to um, take the visual cues when we can. It'll be seamless. Don't worry, Marty. No one will yeah. even know. No one will know. Now that I've um, put the disclaimer out there. No, Miss <laughs> I I do agree with you. But, again, like he didn't look like he had missed a beat. I agree. Like I no, just, totally. I thought it was a, it was an excellent return, and I think as a supporter mm. of the club, I don't think you could ask for much more of a guy who's our one of our most talented players on that list. Uh, the next point I've got down on here is one, another one we touched on before, and once again, I'm not going to brag too much about this, but I was calling for Coleman Jones to come into this team for a long time. Uh, he had a fantastic game. Maybe not quite as good as the Swans game, but better than the Pies game. But but he's making a big impact. And something that doesn't make me feel good to say, but is true, is and you did say it before, he's had a much bigger impact than Combin was having on our team as that second key forward. Yeah, and I think you also and I you also have to think about. Cherry is the other person that you have to kind of think about in this because they're and I call me crazy, okay? Call me crazy. I think there's a small chance Goldstein goes again next year. I think it's I bigger people, than a small I, chance. I think it's I think I, it's pretty I, likely. I he 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 was comprehensively beaten in the ruck um in the first quarter, but I thought that yeah, he just changed, he changed his game to accommodate for the loss of Simkin and um and Greenwood. I'd actually I haven't looked, but I'd love to know how many clearances Goldstein ended on for the day. How many clearances times, Goldstein had or how many hit outs yeah, he had? No, clearances because Simkin and Greenwood are two of our biggest clearance winners. They mm. are all of a sudden both gone by half time. A few times Goldstein was hitting it down to himself and taking the clearance himself or just grabbing the ball out of the rut. And yeah. taking the clearance for himself. So he would have had a few clearances. I think Goldstein plays again next year. Goldstein just, had six clearances. Six clearances for the See? game. I told you. Yeah. I told you. Now he did get a couple of free kicks in there as well, but it just he just he changed the way he played to adapt to the fact that he was getting comprehensively beaten in the rough. Yeah. And that Simkin and um and Greenwood were subbed out, both of them by half time. So I think Sherry's the other person you've got to think about here because I, I've i seen a half of Sherry this year before he went out at the start of the year, but, you know, with that injury. But he didn't, has never really done anything to rock my world either. No. Well, look, this the uh, we, we'll touch on Sherry then instead of swerving. From, I see you've swerved from my Coleman Jones uh, question just well, then, but that's fine. <laughs> It just kind of come because well, it brings it kind of brings another player into the conversation no, because I'd I rather agree. Coleman Jones there mm. and bring it back to Coleman Jones. He, he for me, he offers more than each of those players do at the moment. Uh, yes, yeah, I think he's I think he, he he's better going play. forward than Jerry, and he's better pinch hitting in the ruck than Combin is. And to your point on Jerry, which yeah, well, I guess we can touch on this quickly. I agree with you. I'm not sure where the Jerry hype comes from with anybody. I've never seen him have an outstanding game. I'm not saying he's not good, but I feel like, especially the last two seasons, he's been our most talked about player in the preseasons. Apparently he's having a great preseason every single year. And then he comes in and he's sort of par to subpar. And I'm very, very worried about our ruck stocks going forward if Goldie does go. Um, because Coleman Jones, as we've seen, is a, is a better forward. Um, and Jerry, from what I know about Jerry, with a very limited, you know, visual on him, is he's much more It's like pretty one-dimensional. A, a that 90s-style tap ruckman, but he's not going to be. All I remember, honestly, and it, it's harsh, but all I remember Tristan Jerry doing is dropping open marks in the centre of the ground and not being at a handball. So Hugh Greenwood had more of an impact in the ruck. Well, maybe we re-signed Hugh Greenwood to be our future Ruckman. He could still make all Australian Ruckman. Who knows? There's still a chance. I did call that after round one, but... You never uh, know. There's still time. There's still time. <laughs> well, he was nearly vomiting on the ground at half time, so he's not playing now. Oh, <laughs> no no God, Hugh Greenwood in the ruck. Oh, I could only have imagined how... for being... I'm surprised you didn't run on the pitch, that's for sure. 
<laughs> a plus for being a warrior. And can we just talk? Uh, Hugh Greenwood. Hugh Greenwood had six tackles to half time, and he was still one of the leading tackle. He's no Phoenix Spicer though, is he? Ground. No, no, no. Oh, I don't know. no Hugh Greenwood. <laughs> Hugh Greenwood was very good. He, yeah, he. Um, He's good. He he should get a spot every week in this team. Obviously, he's not going to play next week, and I guess that's a talking point. Does Cunnington come back in, which I'd probably say he does? Um, yeah, I think he will. But, yeah, Greenwood, I mean, even the fans were perplexed as why Greenwood got dropped, uh, yes. you know, a couple of months Welcome ago. Welcome on board anyway. the bandwagon, everyone. Exactly. There's plenty of room for you all. There's I've plenty been of room. all the seats. You've been the only one um, on the bus for no, a while. I have. Well, it's, now I'm, it's better late than ever, guys. That's all I can say. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, no, but going back to that conversation about Cal and Coleman Jones, Larky, CCJ, and Coleman, uh, Coleman, Combin, Col- they can all play it. They can all play in the same side. Combin is very athletic, and Combin's got another dimension to his game. Yeah. With the tackling pressure, he's got a tank. He's, you know, he can compete in the air, so he can push up the ground a little bit. And then you've got Larky and CCJ. You know, yeah. they're sort of your one-two forward. I agree with you. Coleman Jones is a forward and then a second ruck. Yeah. Whether Sherry is good enough to be the first ruck, mm, I personally yeah, don't think so. Still but out there to be think, seen. But I don't think we're going to have to make that decision. For another 18 months now. I, I thought going into this year that Goldie would be going around for the last time this year. I've changed. He's got my legs, mind. the young man. I, I also just as never want him to as handsome as he's ever looked as well right now. Absolutely. Dashing. <laughs> dashing. He um, is dashing. So I just, I just I never I never want that is gonna be a hard day, I think, the day that yeah. he announces his retirement. But I just don't I just right now I can't. It's like Zebul as well. It's the same. Like I know Zebul. We'll touch on Zebul, but like the whole season as a whole, Zebul's been fantastic, and so has Goldstein. The difference is in the last three weeks that they haven't been the only good players, and the young guys have done it. But I could absolutely yeah. see them going around again next year with Tristan Jerry's injury record. His ankle will explode next season as well. So we're probably going to need Goldstein to to be there. But the the one thing I'll touch on quickly with Combin is something I said. I think a couple of weeks ago now, when Combin is back fit, we want them all in the team, right? But he, I, I, I have a gut feeling Combin can play that Mason Wood role as a winger and be pushing up and sure. down the ground. I don't want another third tall in that forward line, just like I don't want a third tall in that back line. And Combin deserves to play because he's pressure, he's got a tank, he's a good user, but I don't know. I could see him absolutely playing that wing role like Mason Wood's doing for the Saints right now. And what Matthew Richardson sort of did back in the day as well. And apparently from a few Bulldog supporters, um, is it Rory Lobb? Is that the guy they got? He's playing that wing role as well, which is very interesting. I'll just leave leave you with one thought, right? If you've got... You've got two tall forwards and Larky's always one of them. Are yeah. you going to replace a guy who's kicking goals with a guy who adds who adds pressure and athleticism? Yeah. No. Yeah. You're not. I agree. So that I think that's sort of where that's at at the moment. Mm. No, fair enough. But um, look, Coleman Jones, another good game, stacking the uh, good performances up. And uh, look, if North Melbourne is listening to this podcast, if you want another scouting manager, a recruiting manager, clearly I've got the eye for talent. So um, you know where to get me, guys. You know where to get me. Um, This is probably going to be the most fun. Give me a call. My DMs are always open to you guys. (laughs) Just slide in. It's fun. Um, This will be the most fun thing to talk about, I reckon. Jai Simpkin in that first quarter was fantastic. Right. And he once again, he like against the Swans when it was actually exactly the same. The Swans came out in that first quarter and it looked like it was going to be a dark day. And Simpkin was the only reason that we were getting the ball out of the middle and staying hanging on. It was the same in this game. The Bombers started hot and Simpkin was getting his hands on the ball and showing leadership. Um, obviously, then when Simpkin goes down, I was incredibly worried because he was already playing very, very well. And then halftime, Greenwood goes down. Let's talk for as long as we need to about how good 
that young midfield played with LDU, Simpkin, and your man Hugh Greenwood not in the side? I just, honestly, Will, let's talk about Will Phillips first. Will Phillips Will is Phillips Joel Solid reincarnated. His last fortnight, where mm. has that come from? Yep. It's like the penny has all of a sudden dropped. And I said this, I think I said it to you, I don't know if it was last time we were on air or if yeah. it was just a conversation we were having. But LDU has taught me to be really patient with yes. our with these star players. And Will Phillips really has had a lot of time interrupted. He obviously had glandular fever and then he's been in and out of the side kind of pretty much his whole career when he's been fit. Mm. He's in there. He's finally got a consistent run and he has just been unbelievable. These last two weeks are the best two weeks of football. He was better last week, but he backed it up this week. Something yeah, special. I no, thought he, he was outstanding. No, I, I agree. Um, it seems to me like he was playing on the wing a lot and as soon as they've moved him into the guts and just being in and under more, he doesn't seem like much of an outside sort of player to me uh, for, as of the last few weeks. I didn't know what he was before. And I think we did talk. I asked you a few weeks ago, what does Will Phillips, what, if he, what are his main attributes he'll bring to the team? Because I, had, I hadn't really seen it. I knew he was good, but you look at certain players, and you go, that's what he does. That's what Zerha does. That's what Zebul does. But I didn't know what Will Phillips was really bringing except talent. And the last three weeks, he's really shown where he fits in. And that is being that Selwood type of getting the ball out, but being a classy user with the football when he does, keeping his feet strong in the contest, but quick, clean hands as well. And he gives us first use of the ball. Absolutely. So he was, I thought he was, yeah, again, sensational today. I think he's had a very good couple of weeks, um, probably coming off his best game that I've, the best career game last week, George Mm. Wardlaw. Hmm. Well, look, oh, we can talk. We can I, talk I about love George, George Wardlaw. I love George. The, the G, he's the new G train uh, for me. He's the new G train. He um, just, and you know what? The thing with George Wardlaw is that he's going to take time. Um, that is obvious, you know, and he tries. So he does what LDU used to do. He tries sometimes to do a little bit, little too, bit much too much and he gets caught. And he was caught a couple of times today, but he, was. he just picks himself back up and yeah. he just keeps going. And every time he stopped, he was absolutely spent because he just gave 110%. Oh, and uh, Kane Corns tweeted um, after the yeah, game that I did see he this. made 17 touches look like 40. And I, I agree. couldn't, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I actually could not. I couldn't agree more. I, he was so impactful yeah. and every, he made every possession count. And I think he, we have got a player on our we have a he's, gem. He's a, we have he's, a, a, he's a superstar. I'm, I'm going to say a controversial yeah. statement right now. Um, and I really believe this, and this is not taking away anything from the other star we've got. George Wardlaw is the guy. Sheasel is brilliant, but Wardlaw has Brownlow talent. Sheasel is fantastic. But I think Wardlaw's ceiling is a little bit higher just because, and they're different players, but I th- at the moment, George Wardlaw is my favourite player in this team. I legitimately went to see if I could buy those old, the, the Bounding Roo jersey that we had in like 2019. And I want the next number I get on the back of my jersey is six. George Wardlaw is my favourite player and he's going to be my favourite player for about 15 years, I hope, because... I'm fully in love with him and he is now the sexiest man on the planet. And he's 18, so it's legal and it's not weird. Uh, but he, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love George Wardlaw and I just, I've, he's so strong. You, he already looks like you cannot tackle him. You can't tackle Very him. Very strong through the hips. Oh, the, like he gets the ball. He'll take a couple of steps and go away from a contest and he hits players on the chest every time. Every single time he'll give us possession and retain our possession when other players would just blaze away. He, he hits targets. Oh, I love George Wardlaw. I love George Wardlaw too. I think you've really covered everything. Um, 
that needed to be said about George. It's him and CCJ. <laughs> if we ever got to hang me, George, and, uh, and, and and CCJ at the pub would be the best time because we'd just be all best friends. I'd love to be a fly. I'd love to be a fly on the wall at that pub. <laughs> You're invited <laughs> to the pub, buddy. Don't worry about it. Oh, great. Love. Thank you. I got an invite. Cracked one, guys. Absolutely. Um, you can invite Jasper. It's cool. He'd fit in with the boys. Jasper, Jasper and Hugh and I. Yeah. I'll bring yeah. my little. You guys have one me. table. We'll have another. And we'll just, uh, we could do like a pub trivia against each other, maybe beer pong if the night goes the right way. And we can all just team up I'm down. and uh, see what happens. I'm down. Um, awesome. All right. So we've got Phillips, we've got Wardlaw in the middle. And then I mm. want to just talk about, I just want to talk about Bailey Scott as well. Uh, yes, please do. Because I think we, last time we caught up, we were talking about Best and Ferris and I said to you, I think it's either Sheezel or Zeeble at this point in time yeah. that's leading the best and fairest. Bailey Scott will be at this at the halfway mark of the year. I think Bailey Scott should be leading the best and fairest. And he's on track to win the best and fairest, I think. Do you reckon he's still on track to win it? I, th- I think yeah. at the moment, I think at the moment it would still be Zeeble. I know it's hard to say after the performance today, but I think it would be Zeeble. Oh, Zeeble or Sheezel, top two. I, I honestly wouldn't be able to tell you. I think maybe Zeeble. Sheezel, I'd probably put Larky, but Fords don't get the love like the midfielders do. But I think Larky's maybe been the next best. He is top five in the Coleman. So Larky maybe. And then I would say probably Bailey Scott would be after that for me. Bailey Scott, Bailey Scott's kind of now become the guy who, you know, he's the guy that takes the ball. You know, he's kind of the last kick out of from defense as we start to transition the ball up the field. Yeah. He's got wheels. He can run and he doesn't – what I love is he doesn't stop running. If he hand passes yeah. the ball off, he's always there for the receive the and just to keep on going. Mm. The overlap run, he's there for it. Smart decision maker, also yep. very clean with his hands. But it's the running. It's the running. And that's something that is – and it, it, in a team that we don't have a lot of quick runners and a team we just don't have – a lot of players who work as hard as he does. Yeah. I think uh, he came, he was third in our best and fairest last year. And yeah. I think he's having, I think now he had a slow start. So maybe that will sort of impact him a little yeah. bit, but I think he's, I think now he's be. at a point and now I think he's better placed now than he was. And I was worried at the start of the year because I thought, oh no, don't tell me last year was sort of a one a one hit wonder, but no, I think he's over. He's actually gone past. Mm. He's gone past his form from last year. I think he's in. I think he's having the. I think he's now in the best form of his career to date. Absolutely. I think Eddie Ford is a bit quiet after the two really really strong games he's had, but yeah, I think quieter, but still player, good with what he did on the day. Still, still had an impact, and I think a young player, you're going to have to expect that. Mm. Um, but Bailey, oh, Bailey Scott, I thought he was also just outstanding. And I think he's had a really, really, really good first half of the year. No, I, I agree. Um, two more players we'll touch on before we end the positives. Well, I'm sure we could talk about it all day. Uh, the Mackay bounce back. What did you think of his game today? So good. He was really good. He was everywhere. He was, he, wasn't um, he? You know, he was intercept marking everything. Um, he was, you know, he was physical as well. In the way he was, he was throwing his weight around. He was like, he just, he looked that again was one of the best games he's played for the year. Yeah. Um, I thought he was excellent. I thought he was excellent. And him and Griffin Logue didn't get in each other's way. Yeah. I found there wasn't, there wasn't, there was a couple of times where Zebul and McDonald got in each other's way. There's a little bit of lack of communication there. He and Griffin Logue don't do that. They actually yeah. really stick. They actually play very well. They play complementary, I think. Um, so, yes, I thought Mackay was excellent. Even when we were rebounding, when Essendon were rebounding the ball outside of our forward 50, yeah. he was chopping the ball. Mm. Um, and the last person that we'll talk about is someone that I guess hasn't fully – Maybe hasn't been on the level of a lot of these other guys that we're talking about, but I think he's gone under the radar and every single week he does what he needs to do. The most efficient uh, disposal in the team. Shout out to Miller Bergman. The guy just kind of like, he doesn't, he's not going to win us a game, but 
I think next year the Sean Atley Club Champ will be renamed to the Miller Bergman Club Champ because Ooh, he just cool. he just shows up every week and he's solid. He does what he needs to do. And I don't know, he I think he was 94% efficiency today again. Something like that. That doesn't surprise me. He's the best ball user in our team. Yeah. And he's the best decision maker. His composure under pressure. Mhm out of this world and that's, you know, and um, and he's playing uh, in a back line with a few very experienced heads there. Yeah. Um, I love him and I'm so – when – and he and Goda as a one-two punch coming out of defence, that's that's dangerous. Uh, that, yeah. you know, that is da- – that's a dangerous prospect. Mm. It would be interesting to see when Goda is available if he comes back and fits in because I, I – w- I like Goda, but he probably hasn't. He's sort of like Jerry for me, where maybe he's shown more than Jerry for me, but still isn't probably in the best 22 for me at the moment, Um, especially with Darcy Tucker and Zeebel and Sheezel going back. And if Taron Thomas is going to play off halfback a little bit, like they talked about, even someone like him and Jackson Archer fighting it out for that last spot, maybe in the back line, uh, you know, it creates depth and it's good and he's a good running uh, sort of half back, but maybe hasn't completely sold me that he should be in the team all the time just yet with Goda. I, I, I can see that. I think he and Bergman played um, Goda. So Goda and Bergman did play together round one and I yep. think they were, I think they they proved a really, a really dangerous one-two punch and I think okay. that... Um, I think Miller, I think both players do stand well on their own, but I think together um, they're definitely quite, I think they're quite a combination. I still play, I, I, I thought Aaron Hall was quite good today, actually. I just want to touch on him too. He was, mm. but for me, Aaron Hall doesn't, like for me, Aaron Hall steps aside when Goda's fit. Okay. So that for me is, that for me is the replacement that I make. Well, that, it's, that's actually not a bad a bad segue. We'll go we'll go to some of the negatives because I have written Aaron Hall in the negatives, but I'm not convinced that he was negative. But I'll explain. So it's like I wrote down that was the most Aaron Hall game I think I've ever seen because he did some things that were brilliant, and you know he he got some really important clearances off the half back line. Through the middle, um, he won the ball a few times and got some clearances. But his disposal in the first half was atrocious. And if we're going to rag on Zeebel for turning the ball over, I think we have to also put Aaron Hall in that category as well. Maybe not in as crucial of a time. Um, And Aaron Hall did more good things than Zeebel did. And I, but I, but I think from, and maybe just be watching it on the telly and you're at the game. So maybe there was a bit of a different view, but like he did as much good as he did bad. So, and the good was very good, but the bad was very bad. And I, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what to think about Aaron Hall. I thought he was okay. I thought he was, I thought he was, I thought he was quite good, but I yeah, think yeah. I'm compa- I'm not, but I'm not comparing that to his best football and comparing that to what he's produced this year. And he has been pretty mm. ordinary this year. I don't think for me, I'd be happy not to play Aaron Hall. And we had this discussion when we caught up last time about playing the kids versus playing the veterans. You play yeah. the veterans who are impacting the game positively. You play Goldstein, you play Zebul, you play Greenwood, you play Shields, right? These mm. are the guys that get the games week in, week out. Aaron Hall, Eh, I'm not so fussed if he's there or not, to be honest. He's mm. all right, but I'd yeah. rather play. I, I mean, Jackson Archer has been playing a bit um, up forward, so whether that whether that is a plan for the long term, yeah, that I doesn't sit well with me. I think I, I'd like to see ja- and to get off topic of Hall, but like I'd like to see Jackson Archer as like a small lockdown defender. Like that's the guy I want to play on Charlie Cameron. You know, yeah. that's the guy I want to play on Cosy Pickett. And that sort of stuff. And when, future. and when Jackson Archer did play last year before he was injured, I thought he was really good. And he, I did again, too. he slotted in same seamlessly at senior level. So, I, for me, I thought Hall was okay today. Probably one of the better games he's played for the year. But his form yeah. this year has been very ordinary. That's kind mm. of where I see it. Um, so 
I don't blame you for having him as a negative because I just, I just, I just wouldn't play him. Yeah, I'd be playing like I'd be playing. A, 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 I mean, it's hard because a lot of these like the, a lot of the life for life replacements are injured at the moment, which is why they're not playing. True, true. So the next point I've got here is. Um, there were open, especially in their forward line um, or in our back line, there's holes everywhere in our back line. Um, and not not that people weren't manning up or anything because I think we didn't – There were, actually, this is a good point. Today, we didn't concede any of those goals where we turn it over in the middle, the ball goes straight over our heads to a guy in about 15 metres of space. Like our defenders were pretty uh, – what's the best word? Like – they did, they did their job properly. They weren't running off their player and all that sort of stuff. But the problem was the Bombers were leading all over the place and there were so many little pockets of space for them to lead into in the 50. And just a stat here, it was 19 to 9 marks inside 50. So we only had 8 marks inside 50 and they had 19. That's, that's unacceptable. It's a lot. It's over double. Yeah, um, that's wild, yeah. I think a lot of that probably, and it came, it came in the first quarter and it came when they had that little, that little um, sort of burst of play in the third quarter where they kicked four goals in whatever, five or six minutes. Um, mm. The ball was coming in at a at lightning pace. A lot of the time it was coming from a stoppage or it was coming from the center bounce. Yeah. So our, we didn't have time to go and help the defenders. So they were kind of caught, they were kind of caught one out and there were a lot of uncontested marks inside their forward 50. So I do, I, I noticed that. And I think a lot of it was just, they just didn't have the support um, that yeah. they probably would have liked because the ball was coming in at such a frantic pace. And mm. a lot of the time it was coming in off the back of a center clearance or it was coming off the back of the stoppage. So I do agree with that. Um, and I think that our defenders like to play a little, they kind of like to hang behind. They don't really like to play that super one-on-one. Yes. Um, yeah. That that one-on-one defense, like that one-on-one defensive sort of style. And that we were caught out with that today for sure. Mm. No, definitely. And yeah, that, that actually is a good point as well. You made just then, which is one I've got written down here. Um, we give goals up very, very quickly after I feel like we work so hard to create our opportunities. And then, you know, we'll work, it'll be five minutes of play without a goal. You know, we'll be chipping the ball around, moving it, grinding, trying to get that into our 50, we'll score. And then bang, they go up the other end in 30 seconds and score. And there was a lot of that as well. We give up goals quickly and lots of them very quickly. And that's the thing. We got out to a 17 point lead in the third, I think it was. And that lead was gone incredibly quickly. And then we held with them and went goal for goal. But that's still a little issue, which will come with experience and time and and coaching. But we do give lots of goals up very quickly. Yeah, we don't know how to stop the bleeding. And I think that's part of also just being a bit slow. Like they they were like the bombers were really quick the way they moved the ball cleanly and efficiently into their forward fifty. We kicked we kicked six goals in a row, um, Mm. and that and then halfway through the third quarter we were as you said seventeen points up. It was gone in the blink of an eye. It was yep and. Again, I'm really proud of our ability to fight back. It's the same thing that we did against Sydney um, a couple of weeks ago, but we've got to find a way to stop the bleeding because it, yeah. that, it, it, you know, you, you're right. You are a hundred percent right. It feels like we work so hard, to get ourselves in a position that is just taken away from us within 10 minutes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, another one I've got here just about our general play is, Two, two points that I guess kind of go together. The amount of free and open players in the corridor for the Bombers this game was wild. They were always switching it into the middle and there'd be three guys there waiting to link up and they were just tearing us apart through the guts. They weren't getting it up and down the wings very easily, but we didn't defend uh, the corridor very well at all. Um, the other thing that goes along with that was... There was uh, uncontested marks to, for the game. The Bombers had 118 uncontested marks to our 88. So 
the disparity there once again is wild and they are playing that chip, 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 chip sort of game, but it works well against us. And they would chip it around the wings, be patient, bang, they'd get it into the corridor and then they'd go. And we just didn't defend the corridor very well at all. And they work in numbers as well. So, mm. you know, once they get the once they get the quick release, they're running, there's four of them running together up the, up the middle of the ground. It's hard to stop them. When yeah. the other thing is, on the other flip of the coin, this happened. This it, it happened in the in the early. It, it's hard because I think we our slow starts are a big negative for us. This is the third yeah. week in a row. In particular, we have given up a potentially game. I mean, we you know we've potentially given up a game ending like lead in, yeah. in the first fifteen minutes of the game. It happened against Sydney. It happened against Collingwood. It happened again today, right? Yeah, and. In the first 15 minutes, we could actually not get our hands on the football. Every yeah. time, every time out of a stoppage, out of a centre clearance, if North took possession of the ball, it was like a it was like bees to honey. There was just a swarm of Bombers yeah. players around our one player. And that killed us. I mean, we obviously the game broke and we we, you know, we got our hands on the footy in the middle and things started the wheel started to turn and you know, so the story goes. But in the early stages of that game, they worked in, they've got a really strong, you know, a really strong zone and yeah. a really strong team, sort of team structure and team play where there's just, they're constantly supported in numbers yeah. wherever the football is. That yeah, no, I agree. I think we've got we've got better at that. My, big, well, my biggest complaint at the start of the year, well, the two that I always complained about was, the long kicking into the Ford 50 with no objective, which we've really rectified in the last three weeks. The other one is getting numbers around the ball. And maybe it's just the useful injection into our midfield. And maybe that is a, a, a byproduct of not having Cunnington in the middle at the moment. But we're getting many more numbers around the ball compared to what we were. And we're not getting beaten in every one-on-one -on -one contest or every, every drop of the ball from a contest that every opposition is just sweeping up all the time. But yeah, we can still improve a lot in that because you're right. It did feel like the bombers always had more numbers around the ball. Yeah, I think so. Um, but I think, I think with time, I agree. That's something yeah. we'll be able to fix. Mm. But I think also it's – I think part of it is a pace thing and part yeah. of it is that we aren't – we just – we like we have a tank. I think our endurance has improved a lot. I think we're running out games a lot better. Absolutely. But in terms of speed, it's still something that we really lack and we have for a really long time. But like you said, that comes with experience and age. So I think we'll be fine. Um, yeah. Two players to end the negatives. Um. This one, this one's not a negative, but I had him in the negatives for the first half, and it is a tale of two halves. Cam Zerha, a complete tale of two halves for him. Uh, he to half time, barely. I think he had something like three touches to half time. I think he kicked a goal with one of those touches in the first half. I can't remember, but a complete tale of two halves with Zerha, and he. He frustrates me. I love Cam Zerha. I, I want him in the team every single week. And I did say this last week, but I don't know. He needs to be consistently impacting the game. And it was good coaching to put him into the middle a little bit towards the end of the game to keep getting him around the ball. And I think once he went into the midfield, he pushed forward from the midfield and kicked a couple of those later goals. But it's a complete contrast with Zerha sometimes because if he maybe performed better in the first half, we may have had a lead going in at half time. I think he's a big confidence player. He is the, he's a player. I think he's one of the, one of the, I think he's one of the players, if not the player that relies on confidence the most of any player on our list. He needs, he needs to kind of get involved in the game from the get go so that he can kind of fire yeah. up and have an impact. And I think we've seen that this year because he has been spending quite a bit of time in the midfield. But I agree with you. He was nowhere to be seen. And he, I think he hasn't. Last year, he had a slow start to the year. Uh, this year, he hasn't really done much for me. He's been good in the middle of the ground, but up forward around the goals. Yeah. 
I think he's been. Li- I think overall he's been a little bit disappointing. I thought he was really good today. Four goals is a great return from him. Yeah, and I think we need to see. Well, he's that a big reason why we were often. even a chance to stay in the game, though, as well. And that's this, and this isn't taking away anything of that because when he's on, he is the, the biggest X factor we've got in our team. If he's on, we're a massive chance. But if he's not, I think he does hurt us. And yeah, I'd like to see more consistency from him. I think he's had a pretty good year. I, I I don't know if he's taken a step this year. If it is, I guess going into the midfield is a bit of a step. I'd like to see him take a bigger step second half of the year and be that consistent, impactful player. You know, a lot of people compare him to Dugowie with how they play and the body size and the forward and midfield combination. And I think that would be a good play to emulate off of for him. But yeah, I would like to see a bit more from Zerha back half of the year. The only reason I guess I'm a bit frustrated by it is because I know how good he can be and we see it in patches. And if he could do that more weeks than not, man, we've got a fantastic player on our a game-winning player on our hands, but it's the consistency. Absolutely. He's an X factor and we know what he does when he's at his brilliant best. I mean, no more brilliant than the King of Marvel. The King um, of Marvel. So... And I and I and I love I love Cam and I think you're right. You know, not only was he scoring in the second half, he was generating scoring opportunities, yeah. and he did look a bit more lively. So I really hope that you know maybe he just needs a little bit more of a break. Uh, I know he's just come back from injury, but maybe yeah. he you know after the bye he kind of can come out sort of fit and yeah. firing. And the last player, just really quick, we don't want to harp on it too much. We'll just go for like two minutes. Jack Siebel's game. Um, he's been fantastic all season and I don't want people to forget that, but those out of bounds on the fulls later in the game probably were the difference in the end. They definitely scored off one of them. I don't know if they did off the other one or two he did as well, but he really hurt us today. Yeah, it was. Um, it's, it's hard to watch as well, I think, because Jack... Jack's had such a good year and I think people will just look for any one negative just to kind of jump on him. Wasn't, wasn't that good today in general. Um, And those, he's played over 250 career games, right? And a significant portion of those would have been played at Marvel. It wasn't one out on the full, it was like three or four. It was, yeah. Like, like how? Yeah. How? And the last one was the was the killer. I mean, that's yeah. the, that's the game. That goal comes. Yeah. You know, it just oh, yeah. it well, really look, upsets me. But I know, I know. I think on it. we're not going to dwell. On it. We'll... He because he's his, he'll be his harshest critic this week. No, so that's what I was about to say. He, I, I fully, fully expect him to go away. Uh, he's going to know exactly what he did wrong and he'll come back and be better from it because of his experience. So, look, maybe that's all we touch on with Jack. I don't want to bash him too much. Um, but, yeah, poor game today. Um, but I, I I believe he'll come back stronger from it. I think we've seen enough from him through his career to know that he'll know what he did wrong. And you're right, he's his own harshest critic. But, um, but yeah, that's all the negatives that I've got anyway. So... Yeah, what a what a recap of the game, Marnie. This is why we come here and get your insight. You are the messiah and the guru of the North Melbourne Football Club, you know? That is definitely not true, but I'm going to take <laughs> it and run with it. <laughs> no worries. Someone did comment on my post before asking if Jack Siebel rubs Vaseline on his boots before he plays, which was funny, but um, poor Zeeves. Oh, anyway. I know he's had a really yeah. great year. I, I, yeah, we're, yeah, let's just let, we're, we're done with this. Gonna move talk. on. Um, any more thoughts from you, Marnie? Before we before we wrap this one up, there is just one more thing I want to touch on, and that's well, person I should say is um Luke McDonald. I mm. thought he played a real captain's game today. Um, fair, fair play too, obviously. Yep. Obviously, Simkin went uh, was was out with concussion pretty early on. Um, there was a couple things with with McDonald. First of all, that bomb from fifty five meters out. That's was a great goal, Luke McDonald. I mm. said, I've seen a few of those from Luke McDonald um, in our time. I thought that was. I think North posted up that there was four hundred days or something like four hundred days 
Sorry, yeah, just 400 days or so since he last kicked his goal, I think they posted up or something like that. So it's been a couple of years, I think, since he's kicked one. Something. But, yeah, a couple of years. But he's, and he's had a couple very similar to the one that he kicked this afternoon. But, yeah, yeah. you know, Simkin's just – we've just lost Simkin. And if there's something that's going to get the side sort of fired up, it was going to be that. So that's the first mm. thing. I thought that was a ripper. Second yeah. of all, Jake Stringer, he played on Jake Stringer when Jake Stringer played up forward. Stringer kicked two goals, I think. He was good, but he wasn't like he's damaging yeah. his damaging best. It's sort of just sort of he played and, you know. He was there. Was he was on the ground, yeah. Yeah, but I thought McDonald probably had him quite well covered. But mm. then it's, I think for me, what speaks volumes about Luke McDonald is the photo that emerged after the game yeah. with his hands in his um, head in his hands and Griffin Logue consoling him. Yes. That is someone, I mean, that is someone who just loves this club with yeah. all his heart. And that for me was, that was it. No, ab- absolutely. I think, yeah, I've been a little bit of a critic of, of Luke McDonald recently. Uh, I don't think untowardly. I think, um, yeah, recently, maybe hasn't been making the impact that we know that he can, but yeah, I thought he was very, very good today. Um, One of the other points that we didn't get to, I I didn't end up putting in, in the negatives was my point was just going to be Jake Stringer is an A grade flog. And I do like, and you just can tell just by looking at him um, that, you know, that he'd just be, if you were at a bar or something and he was walking around, you'd be like, well, let's just hop to the next joint, you know? Um, but <laughs> I think, uh, no, McDonald, I, I agree. He, he was, it was definitely captain like today. And I think that's the thing that maybe I haven't seen from him as much as Jai this year. Um, I don't really think I've been super, I haven't really criticized him as a captain, but maybe compared to Jai, I think Jai is maybe more of the captain and Luke McDonald does a great backup role. But you're totally right. Like those scenes at the end of the game, the guy bleeds blue and white and is the epitome of shin bone of spirit. And I don't know, it's, you do love to see that to get the fans on their side. And I don't know, it makes us feel like we're all together, right? Because it shows that they care and that's, That's what we want to see. And you can see by the performances like night and day that compared to Port Adelaide and and Brisbane and Melbourne, they didn't look like they cared at all. But the last few games they do. And, yeah, I think McDonald epitomises that. I think so. I think that's the the one thing you've got to remember is Luke McDonald is one of us. He grew up supporting North. Yeah, He's a North man through and through. Now, you can obviously adopt that when you come to the club as a player. Mm. But for me, yeah, it just... Luke McDonald, that photo of him, if you haven't seen it, see if you can go and find it. Um, it symbolised how we were all feeling. At the yep, end the exactly. No, I agree. It's, um, yeah, great great to see that from Luke McDonald. I, I think I needed to see that a little bit with him um, just from the last, yeah, just the last month or so. But it's nice to see him really, I don't know, get down to ground level with us. And I think he's a good communication line between the fans and the club on field. And I think he makes us feel more connected to the team. If, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And yeah, he, he reflects all of us. There's a bit of Luke McDonald in all of us tonight. So for me, I think that, yeah, I think it was a real captain's performance from him and I definitely didn't want to not, touch on that no for sure um but yeah other than that i guess that's kind of it disappointing not to get the win um but we're on we're we're on such a good path to where we're going to be soon and you know they're giving us so much reason to stay the course and to to trust the process and hold on to what they're trying to build and you know without trying to gush about him too much again. I think Wardlaw alone is just enough reason to tune in right now. And you Bailey squats, Scott's new Sheezles and Larkies and, and all these guys, Miller Bergman's and whatnot that we're really building something here. So I'm glad as much as I'm disappointed, we haven't got the result just yet. We can't be unhappy with the way they're they're playing. Yeah. hundred percent. 
it will come and it it won't be too far away and the few we, we we know that the future's bright and we've known that throughout the whole year but the last few weeks you actually start to believe it yeah because i've said oh yeah the future's bright and you've got glimpses here and there and you know you say it but i feel like now you can really actually believe in in where we're going and what we're doing there's visual evidence so to back that up you know Absolutely. And I, I really, I really hope that I really hope Mackay can see it. And this, this baby yeah. triggers him to resign. I really hope that the fans can get on board and I hope that internally we believe it to the point where the self-belief is sort of, I think the self-belief for me is the last piece of the puzzle to get the four points. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what we we're touching on before with, um, once a win comes, I think they're going to be so confident that it more will will come. But if you've been, and I said this a few weeks ago as well, if your Zerhas and Larkies and Mackays, the, these guys who got drafted like 2017, 18, 19, that's, this has been their whole career so far. And they don't, they probably don't have the belief. They, they, they want to have it. And there's players like Zebel and Goldie, but, you know, Ford comes in and Wardlaw and Sheasel and Bergman, these guys who haven't been on the end of bad results for three or four years, and you can see how energetic they are. And like we all saw, Wardlaw against the Swans, I really do believe his performance and his youthful vigour lifted that team to perform against the Swans when the heads would have dropped other weeks gone by. So, yeah, I think we're on the right track. Just be patient. 2028 Premiership, you heard it here first on the Further North podcast. Hopefully a few more wins between now and then. Well, yeah, it's true. We'll just get no more wins until 2028 and then we'll just win, you know, we'll go 10 from 11 like Collingwood have and win the Premiership. So, uh, However we get there, if we get there in the end, that's fine. Yeah, I'm not too that's concerned, fine. to be honest. I won't complain. <laughs> Um, well, I guess we we wrap it up there, Marnie, but thank you for jumping on after uh, going all the way down at prime time at Marvel Stadium. Uh, I know you got back late. What's it, like 10.30 at night right now, and I've got to do some editing and get this thing out for everyone on Monday morning. So I appreciate you coming on, and the, I'm sure the fans will swarm back in numbers when they hear that you're on the podcast. Uh, uh, thanks for having me, and I'm always up for a chat literally any hour of the day when it comes to North, so... <laughs> There'll be many more. Uh, until next time. Absolutely. Well, next one we'll make sure we do it in person just so we don't get the, the Zoom cutouts and the, uh, the, the coughing behind the camera, uh, which I've done a fantastic job of talking over the top of. So nobody would even know unless we said something. But, uh, no, look, it's, uh, you'll be back in the, uh, in the studio soon and we'll, we'll chat in person. Yes, definitely. I had to say something about the coughing and I do apologize if I've like just yeah gone quiet a couple of times, but mm. na- get nasty flu season, guys. Look after yourself. Absolutely. Go and get your bloody shots or whatever you've got to do. If, if that's still a thing, I don't know. COVID ruined us all. It's definitely, it's definitely a thing. I would <laughs> yeah. recommend it after what I've just gone through. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, have you got any parting words for all of the, the listeners until next time? Just send your love and prayers to Hugh Greenwood <laughs> yes. after that nasty knock. Oh, that was it was bad, wasn't it? Hey, he'll be back after the bye, oh. reinvigorated, reinvigorated, refreshed, and uh, three votes H Greenwood against the Bulldogs, I say. I'm ready. I'm so there for it. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, we'll talk to you again soon, Marty. Thanks, Josh. All right, bye. So thanks once again to Marnie for um, taking the time to do that Zoom chat. Thank you for listening through um, the slightly lesser audio quality. I know a lot of you guys don't really mind, but um, I kind of do. I did audio design uh, back in the the end of my high school days and used to do a lot of music and things like that. So it bugged me a little bit, but still a great chat. And uh, yeah, next time we'll make sure it's nice and crispy for your ears. What we're going to jump into now is a few of the, uh, the questions and the comments from the listeners. Thank you once again for writing in, guys. I really do appreciate it. Just so you guys know, I'm going to ask for your thoughts after every game and all the big moments that happen with North Melbourne. And you can find that on Facebook at Further North Podcast and Instagram, Further North Pod. I am slowly considering getting Twitter. I've heard the North community on Twitter is big. 
Um, Marnie is going to give me a hand in teaching me how to use Twitter. Um, I used Twitter once in probably like 2012, 2013, and uh, I didn't know what I was doing. It was crazy. So I'll do it for you guys though. How about that? But not yet. Give me like two to six months. Anyway, let's jump into the questions and just to preface really quickly, there were so many this week. Thank you so much to everyone who has written in. I, there's like 40 Facebook comments and even more on Instagram. So unfortunately, I can't read all of them, but I've just gone through at random and, and picked some of the ones that stood out to me. So we've got Stephen Dempster. It's a shame the kids gave their all and then there was Zebel. Just butchering it, so disappointing. I think I did chat about this with Marnie, but I think the Zebel slander is a little bit harsh. Yes, it was a disappointing game from Jack, um, but he's arguably been our best player all season. So he may have cost us the game yesterday. He may not have. We don't know how it's going to play out. Poor form, but he's going to be his own harshest critic and he'll come back from it. But look, let's not forget what Zebes has done to this club. Um, Scott West, the Bulldog Scott West? Probably not. Um, we're going to be okay. Those young boys, Phillips, Shizu and Wardlaw, that's the future. Welcome back, Taron. Great game. Yeah, absolutely. How good was that midfield standing up? As soon as Simpkin and uh, uh, Greenwood, sorry, went, I was about to say Wardlaw, Greenwood went down, I was like, oh, they're probably going to run over the top of us here. Um, and I think Taron was fantastic playing a lot of midfield minutes like me and Marnie talked about. Um, yeah, a great welcome back for him. Jason Elliott, our own mistakes cost us the game. Does Zebel rub Vaseline on his boots? Far out. I did read this one earlier on the Zoom. Overall, happy with the effort. The kids are amazing. Jason, <laughs> that comment did make me laugh. Um, look, Zebel might need to put some bloody grip tape on his boots for the next game, but we love uh, Jay-Z. But yes, overall, happy with the kids and the effort. And it's, yeah, going forward, we are going to be okay. Uh, James Duke. Great game. So close considering the injuries. Mackay and Logue, huge kids in the middle. Spectacular. Spectacular. And Thomas played well. Absolutely. Um, especially Mackay and Logue in the back, uh, the back line. Fantastic by those two. We've got Anthony Cullen. Great effort. Can't ask for much more than a goal for goal battle. Young guns were awesome. I wonder what that game would have been like for a neutral as well. I reckon it would be pretty entertaining. I'll back Zebuin to turn it around. Yes, it was heartbreaking, but if we're honest with ourselves, honourable losses are better for us than courageous wins. Yep, I'm talking about the draft. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, I, Marnie did bring up something like that when we were chatting as well, that, you know, it, it's it's better, even though we're disappointed after that loss, you know, hard, hard-fought loss is better than a, you know, an absolute blowout and a, you know, a, the, the opposition running away with the ball. So, yeah. At the moment, we can be happy with the great efforts, and I think this season that's what we're after. But there has to be a point where we start going, it's time to win. But not just yet. I'm really happy with this, uh, where the team is trajecting, and Anthony must be as well. Uh, Christopher Moore, how good is it when the blood pumps during games again? No more checking out at quarter time. I loved this comment, absolutely. Um it's so good being able to watch a full game and not know the result and seeing the effort. My heart was pumping watching that final quarter. And it's good that we're even there now, unlike the D's and the Lions and, and the power game, even though I guess quarter time we're in that one. But you know what I mean? Like, it's a great comment. It, it's so true. We, we are in games now. We're competitive and we're playing watchable football, which it's been a while. Jesse Stevenson says... North keep rising my, uh, raising my expectations every week, and I'm here for it. North to beat the Giants next week. Well, that, once again, kind of goes back to what myself and Marnie were talking about. Um, do you bring LDU in, even though he might be a little bit underdone? Because we can absolutely beat the Giants next week, as long as we keep playing like this, which they've shown consistently they are. Big decisions on the selection table for Rats. Natasha Burns. Uh, regular one around here. Jeez, you're asking us why we are still fired up. Sorry, Natasha, I apologise for that. Too soon after the game. The young ones showed so much. I can't get enough of watching Wardlaw. Absolutely. He just goes and goes and goes. Tackles someone, they pass it. Then he goes for the next guy. Dude has no off switch. It's amazing to watch. He's like watching a reincarnation of a young Laidley. Interesting comparison. Never stops running, never stops tackling and hits a target. That Zebra kick in last minute, dear God, WTF. 
I mean, I'm sure everyone will blame him, but he's probably doing enough of that himself, so I won't add to the pylon. I just hate losing to that team. <laughs> Effing hate it. And to see Brad Scott's bitter little pie hole just made me more ragey. Look, I think that comment sums up a lot of what North fans are feeling right now. I, I can't add much more to that one. Uh, Mitchell Bye, we look really close to winning a game. I know that sounds stupid, but it looks like we could win one. There was a bit there where we didn't look like uh, like that at all. Boys played hard until the final siren. It hurts, but I'm so proud. That is exactly what my brain was going through after the siren. I think I said on the Zoom with Marnie, I don't know how to feel. And that's because I really thought we could win that one. And I feel like we really deserve it. But I can't be mad at the performance, but I'm mad at the result. Yeah, we're all over the place, aren't we? Alexander McNear. Whatever the AFL's version of Supermax is, we need to give it to Shees, Wardlaw and Scott. Logan Mackay worked really well today. Well, look, Shees and Wardlaw are all signed up. Bailey Scott signed last year as well, so those guys are under contract. And uh, Logan Mackay worked really well today. Absolutely, absolutely. Rich Whitman, shout out to Bergman. Rarely gets beat in a one-on-one and rarely cops a mention. Yes, perfect timing with that comment as well after the Zoom. That was my last point on the day. Um, yeah. Bergman is underrated and uh, I think next year we might be calling the club champ the uh, Miller Bergman club champ because every week seven to eight out of ten never makes a mistake doesn't isn't going to win us a game off his own boot but you need players like that um, he also goes on to say no LDU or Cunnington Simpkin played one quarter and Greenwood played two we won center clearances 18 to 10 and total clearances 40 to 38 what a midfield yeah you can't understate that effort by that young midfield. And that's what makes me happy moving forward, that we we have a future here. Um, Alex Nancaro. That one hurts the most out of any loss this season, but we really left it all out there. Yeah, and I think that's why that one hurts so much because that's the one we deserve to win the most. Young Guns absolutely shined. Give Wardle the 2024 Brownland medal right now. Coleman Jones uh, had his best game so far. Thomas Phillips, Sheasel Scott, Bergman all starred. That Logue and Mackay uh, were rock solid pretty much all game by a couple of errors. Zeebo, I love you, but boy, oh boy, you tested that love today. Really um, hope we can turn one of these uh, tough losses into a win. More for morale than points. Yes. Um, <clears throat> echoing what all of us sort of think as well there. All that is true, Alex. Um, we'll get there. Richie White. What can I say? Wardlaw for Arden Street Mayor. Um, is going to be a gun. Midfield starting to fire. Even with Greenwood and Simkin missing, we played a great brand. Bucket stepped up. Backline is improving. Too many players to mention. Shin boner for life. Couldn't agree more there, Richie. Uh, Shane Seymour. I hate losing to the Marshmallows. Secondly, I don't think Ben Mackay is out the door. The contract's probably on hold uh, with the CBA agreement is done. Um, lastly, win a final lesson done. And nothing for 6,780 days. Fantastic. I love the pettiness. Um, Essendon don't know what it's like to win a final, and we really made sure of that in 20, uh, 2014, was it? Um, we're always going to have that over them until they beat us in a final, and that could probably never happen. Yeah, the Mackay out the door thing is interesting. I'll touch on this quickly. Um, it's easy to say he's out the door when he doesn't play well. Um, he did do a really good interview after the game, and seemed pretty upbeat on where the team is at. Um, It's good to see him be a little bit more vocal because he is in the leadership group, but we don't really hear much from him. Um, So, yeah, look, I'm 50-50 on Mackay. My my heart says he'll stay, my head says he'll leave, and your head is right most of the time. But, yeah, look, I hope we hear something about that soon because we really need to keep him. Um, Glenn Boxshall, losing Simpkin and Greenwood before the half... Uh, was shattering to see. The young mids could be dropped, uh, could have dropped their heads and Dons could have easily ran away with it, but credit to these young kids we're playing. Uh, they held their own and kept us in the game and showed us that Shinbone is spirit um, and fought all the way to the end. Wardlaw is a beast, going to love watching him grow. I can feel it turning for us. A win's not far away. Go room. Could not agree any more with that, sir. We have Paul Minotti, a regular around here as well. I was so impressed with Will Phil and George Wardlaw. OMG. Uh, it was a great game and kudos to the North supporters. I stood with behind the goals near the cheer squad end. You made it so much fun. Well done to all the North fans as well. The, on the broadcast, they loved pointing out 
how many Essendon fans there were compared to North. You just wait, guys. Wait till we're up and about. We'll come in droves. Jonathan D. Redmond. Great uh, return game from Thomas. Yep, absolutely. It was really good seeing him back and um, didn't really look like he missed a beat after having that much time off, so good on him. Oscar Loveday. Oh, I've, I love reading his last name. That's, I wish, I'm jealous of your last name, Oscar. That's awesome. Um, I'm sitting back thinking, yep, very happy to not have Aiden Core out there. Logue and Bucket staying to sync up. Sad with Sheezel's little check side uh, swinging on the wrong side of the post. I felt relaxed watching the last five minutes as I was happy for North to just be there with a chance to win. Felt good losing uh, because of skill errors rather than having the rule book thrown at us. Yeah, I see where you're coming from there. I mean, we'll touch on a few points. Aiden Core, hopefully he finds it very hard to get back into this team because the back line has looked the best in the last three weeks when he hasn't been here. Um, Logan Bucket syncing up, absolutely. Larky should have definitely gone back and taken that kick. Like I said with Marnie, you're the full forward of this team. You're one of the best goal kickers in the league and up there in the Coleman. Go back and put that through the sticks. Don't be handballing off. I don't care who's running past. And yeah, the umpiring, look, umpires don't really like North very much. Um, it's easy to pay free kicks against us compared to like a Collingwood, so... That's just something we've got to get used to until we get better. Aiden Collar. Looks like we have entered the honourable loss part of our rebuild. Young core of players looking good and get games together. First time in a long time, none of our senior players were our best. Love the show. Thank you, Aiden. And yeah, I really agree with you. It's great seeing uh, the Sheezels, the Wardlaws, the Phillipses, Larky, Zerhard, Taron Thomas, Bergman, these young guys being the best on the park instead of the Zebels and the Goldsteins. So, yeah, that's really, really good to see. Um, and, yeah, the honourable losses stage of our rebuild, I think that's a really good point to make as well because the last three weeks we've really seen a change in this group and it's consistency now. Once we get this performance as like our base performance, that's when the wins will come. So it will come and it'll be this year. I, I really believe that. Um, Tori McGaffin was at the game... And wow, I was not disappointed. I took my daughter down for her first game. She's three. Unreal. A little shin boner. And she had a ball. Got a photo with she's. She loved it. That's awesome. The boys really went down swinging. So happy with that game. Building some something special here. And he has posted the photo of him and his daughter there with she's in the background. That's awesome, uh, Tori. That's awesome. Um, Look like uh, you're doing a great job uh, breeding the next generation of North fans, and I'm sure she'll carry the Shinbona spirit. And, uh, you know, she won't have remembered the hard times when they're winning premierships. I'm sure, you know, she'll be 20, and uh, we've won the premiership five times, and everyone's going, ugh, of course you're a North fan. But we know what we went through. Um, so we'll jump over to Instagram. Matty Mills says, hate losing to Essendon, though. Absolutely. Um, but, hey, we'll get them. We'll win a premiership before Essendon do. Um, I Marcus underscore says, Will Phil will be the best player of that 2020 draft top 10. That's interesting. I'd actually like to go back and look at what the top 10 was because I do not remember anyone else around him. Um, Marcus, if you've got that top 10, please send it through to me and may I'll mention it on the next episode because, yeah, I don't remember. But Will Phil, he's showing his worth now, isn't he? Uh, Juzzy Street says, it's nice knowing the AFL public enjoyed watching our kids, not just us. I think that's an awesome point. That's why I chucked this one in. You know, like I've said many times, I work at a barber shop and I talk a lot of football and kids are coming in and talking about Harry Sheasel. And that's such a massive thing. I've got five, six, seven-year-olds coming into the barber shop and they're like, Harry Sheasel. And that's a massive sign that our football club is getting back into the media and just like everyone under the age of 15 follows Richmond and Dustin Martin's their favourite player. Maybe Sheezel could be that going forward for us. So, yeah, great point. Uh, Giddy's Tuckman, surely we'll win one of these ones, right? With a crying emoji. Don't worry, we'll get there. Um, Giants next week, you heard it here first. Tommy Harris 4 says, We'll fill three votes for Sean Atley, club champ. Tommy, you must have read my notes, mate. That might be coming up just after these comments. But, uh, yeah, you're onto something there. Arbars, uh, Arbar sorry, says, Essendon, lucky to just fall over the line. Uh, we'll enjoy beating these guys for the next 10 years. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. That's coming. Don't worry. Mike po- Posullivan. Hopefully I got that right. Uh, Sublime. Taz Sublime. Wardlaw, wow. If we have LDU and Simka back, uh, we win uh, by six goals. Great times ahead. Couldn't agree more, uh, Mike. Couldn't agree more. I think, once again, a toss-up if we play LDU next week. But I don't know. The wins are going to come. And uh, Wardlaw for Brownlow. Reese.Delaney87. Elvis dipped himself in oil at halftime. And boy, did it get the engine going. This is exciting. Elvis's game was interesting because the times he touched the ball, um, I thought he was very good. Maybe a little bit quieter, quieter out of the three games that he's played this season. But um, I don't know. He does something when he's around the footy, doesn't he? Amar 16. Uh, love this team, but Spice needs to go back to VFL. I, I, I agree with you before this game. I think he, he did enough to hold his place. I think he's on... He's on, uh, the, on the fence at the moment. I think he could be dropped any week, but if he performs like that, um, he has a place in this team. One, because he was good, still didn't kick any goals like me and Marnie talked about, but um, he was very good today. It's the best game I've seen him play. He needs to add goals, but um, look, he's got his spot for another week, but I think it's week by week for him. Riley underscore Masterson underscore 14. Proud, but need to reinforce defense. And find Larky uh, some more help in the forward line. I think Coleman Jones has done that. I think the forward line's actually working pretty well. The last three weeks, look at the scores we've kicked. Um, Larky's back to kicking a few every week. I don't know. I think the balance is pretty right in that forward line. Zerha, a tale of two halves like we spoke about. But um, yeah, I don't know. The balance of Larky and Coleman Jones is much better than Larky and Combin. And maybe that's just because uh, Combin hasn't got the the repetition in games yet. But Coleman Jones has still only played like 13 games for his career or something, hasn't he? So, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe 13 games for North. I can't remember. But um, I don't know. I'm not too concerned about the forward line right now. R. Burke 8 says, I'd rather be a Room fan than a Dons fan. And you know what? It's as simple as that, isn't it? We know in our hearts that we're better than them. Um, You've got a better list. You've got, well, I mean, at the moment, maybe a better coach, but uh, you only just did us and we're rebuilding and you're not. So we're going to flog these guys for the next decade. Don't worry. Um, Liam Dot Ellison could only catch the game via radio. Old school. I love it. I hope it was AM radio. But sounded like Spicer cracked in. Game high nine tackles. He really, really did. If even just one goal, I may have given him a vote in Sean Atley Club Champ. Who knows? But uh, you just need to start getting on the scoreboard, Phoenix. Um, Harley Harbour says, our best game. A shame, um, the one small mistake from Shizu and Zeebel. Good signs to come. It's a shame, but it's all part of the process. And in a year's time, we're not even going to remember this stuff. So let's really just focus on how good they're playing as a team. So we've got Jacob McAuliffe, underscore. It's like the players expect to lose in the last couple of minutes. Need to learn to win. I put this one in because I actually don't agree with that as of this game. Um, I think the last few games, and definitely the the season before the last three weeks, that is the case, I think. And I think I did talk to Marnie about it again, is the guys who have been here five, six years, they've had this repetition of losing a lot. But you can see when Wardlaw came in against the Swans that he really, really lifted this team. So I think that mentality is slowly going, Jacob. I really do. Um but you're like, you, you have to get over the line at the end of the day. So we're getting there and we're getting closer. George underscore BR99. No LDU Cunners Simkin. Young call stepped up. Geez, the future is bright. Absolutely it is. Uh, Jared Andrews says, Taryn Thomas was fantastic. Wardlaw and Sheezel are dynamic duo already. Yeah, for sure. Um, Sheez is already driving Wardlaw around while he gets his peas. So um, those guys are going to be a star duo for 10 to 15 years. And Taron, yep, fantastic by him. Uh, Tom Robinson, 128. Nick Larky got absolutely sold. Uh, should have been paid about 20 free kicks. And look, it's hard not to try and be that supporter. You think your team's always hard done by. But I tell you what, they were all over Larky all game. And I reckon he should have got a couple of free kicks in front of goal. If he was wearing a black and white striped jersey, um, absolutely he gets those free kicks. But look, it is what it is. 
Um, so that's all the questions, guys. Thank you for writing in. And uh, apologies if I didn't get to your question, but keep writing in. We will get to you uh, eventually. Sean Atley Club Champ time. Um, I forgot the name, but uh, one of the commenters on Instagram there did say Phillips three votes for Sean Atley Club Champ. And you're totally right. Phillips has the three votes. It was a complete toss-up for me, Phillips and Wardlaw. I do think I'm looking at Wardlaw through rose-tinted goggles a little bit right now. But third game to be doing that. Look, Will Phil had more possessions. I think he had slightly more of an impact than Wardlaw. But I think Wardlaw gave us the energy. Um, and Kane Corns was right. It did feel like Wardlaw had 40. So Will Phillips gets three votes. Wardlaw gets two. And I've given Ben Mackay the one vote at the end, I think. A great response. Um, and, yeah, that's the form we need from him. So he, he deserved his vote. I think it's Phillips and Wardlaw's first votes for the year. And Mackay's one vote takes him to three votes, equal with Zerha and Greenwood. So, yeah, it's getting pretty tight at the top between Shees and Larky. Um, 14 votes for Shees at the top, 10 for Larky. LDU's got seven and he's missed half the season. So hopefully he comes back soon and can make a late run. Uh, Stevenson's got five as well. Scott's got five. Logue's got four. So, look, it's sort of like F1 at the moment. The uh, Verstappen is the sheasel, and he's running away with it. But um, there's some guys hanging around below him. So we'll see how that uh, club champ plays out for the rest of the year. So I'm going to call the army out on this one, guys. All you listeners, I love you guys so much. Um, and remember, we're going to read out a couple of reviews now. But um, I've just looked at the... Apple podcast reviews, some flog has given me two stars. Look, all the other reviews are five stars, 30. I've got 35 star reviews and thank you to everyone who's ever left a five star review on, on Apple. But whoever that one flog was that left two stars, sounds like an Essendon fan to me um, or a Port Adelaide fan. Maybe it was Horn Francis. Maybe he got on and left a negative review. It's taken my five star rating on Apple down to 4.9. So I'm not happy with that. Anyone listening on Apple right now, please get on and give me a five-star review. Leave a comment. I'll read out your comment, whatever it says. doesn't matter how much profanity is in it. Um, and get me back to five stars because 4.9, not good enough. Not good enough. Who's that guy who put two stars? Anyway, it is what it is. So we've got a couple of reviews on Spotify this week. Um, I did miss one last week, so I apologize. Uh, Arnie says, Mate, I enjoy your podcast and your efforts putting these podcasts together. Do yourself a favor, go back to last week's game and watch Jeremy Howe's game. Uh, his effort as a sub was very impressive. Uh, Daniel Howe's game, I assume uh, you meant to say there. Um, look, I love your comment. Thank you so much and I appreciate you so much as a listener. Um, but you'll have to offer me a lot of money to go back and watch anything that Daniel Howe has done. He's been fine the last few weeks, um, but... He's not on the team right now, and it shows that it's kind of the right decision. Uh, Jason also says, always love the pod uh, podcast. Great to hear other points of view on where we are at. Thank you so much for that review, Jason. Yes, always try and be, I don't know, as objective as possible. Or, um, you know, I don't want to just be the guy who gushes about North all the time, thinks we're great, and doesn't give any sort of, you know, decent perspective. So, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that, man. So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to jump into a bit of a round review before we wrap this podcast up. Might be another long one, but thank you guys for listening all the way through. Um, yeah, the longer ones are actually the most listened to, so I don't know why I worry about it, but it's great to get Marnie or any of the uh, close to a flag boys on just to have a chat about North. Um, but let's not talk about North for a second and let's talk about the AFL in general. Um, Friday night we had Melbourne play Carlton. The Blues, the Blues. I Imagine if we could play them now because we would absolutely destroy this team. It's weird with the Blues because I like the Blues as a team. I kind of would have liked to see them do well. And the same with the Ds. These are the two teams outside of North that I kind of wanted to see have some success. Carlton are just abysmal, aren't they? Like 44 points in a game of football. I know it was a bit damp and it was a gritty game, but 44 points... Mate, that makes our team look like we're the best forward line in the league. The other thing was, and I think I did talk to Marnie about this a little bit, um, but Mackay snapping the ball from 45 out on not much of an angle. It's uh, what's happening with the game. Um, I sound like a bit of a boomer, but 
is this just like Gen Z stuff coming in? I don't know what's going on, but um, yeah, I've, I've never seen this many people snapping the ball from basically directly in front of goal until this season right now. This wasn't happening that much last year. Um, not this much anyway. But the D's get the win. Um, not super impressive by the D's, to be honest, but Carlton are just so bad that, yeah, most teams just kind of win against them. Um, Port and Hawthorne. Uh, I mean, to be fair, I mean, Hawks scored 96 points. That's not a bad effort for a young team, but Port do look good, don't they? And I, I hate it, but Port look good. Um, West Coast and Collingwood. Ah, a gallant effort by West Coast? I mean, 57 points against the Pies for how the Eagles have been playing. Only 63-point loss. I don't know. I was predicting over 100, to be honest. Um and coming from a North fan, that's pretty rich. So, yeah, look, did what they had to do in that game, the Pies. They're the best team in the league. Uh, we carry on. We don't want to talk about the Pies too much. Uh, the Bulldogs and the Cats. I thought the Bullies would get up in this one. Um, but who knows what's happening with the Cats. I mean, they'll turn up and have a good week. But next week they might lose again, which is great to see. I like seeing the Cats lose. So, yeah, Cats get the win again. And they're there or thereabouts. But a very confusing team this season, aren't they? Same with the Bulldogs. I mean... The Bulldogs have been sneaky good uh, the last couple of months. They did start very poorly, but they are sitting seventh right now. Um, I don't know. This is probably a game they needed to win to really convince me that they're going to be in the top eight. So it's a crazy top eight at the moment. I think the top four is pretty set um, with Brisbane, Port, Melbourne and Collingwood. But from five to like, oh, I don't know, 12th or 13th, even 14th with Carlton, any of those teams could really make a late run and get in the finals. So not as many great teams this year, but a lot of teams sort of sitting around the middle. Um, the Suns beat the Crows. Once again, the Crows, I don't know what to think about. They'll pull out a crazy win every now and then, and we kind of thought they were maybe better than they were. But are the Suns good? Because I'm, I'm never going to be convinced the Suns are good. You know, like the Suns had a great win on the weekend, and they're still sitting 11th and just kind of irrelevant. Um, but they win games. I don't know. I'm so confused what to think about the Suns. Um, but yeah, poor loss by the Crows, I think, if they were really, really trying to push for the top eight. And the last one we'll chat about is Giants and Richmond. Probably the best game of the round besides Essendon North. Who knew? Sunday games really pulling out all the stops. Um, yeah, Richmond got the win. Um, they're obviously not at their best. I think the Giants are playing at their best right now. I don't think they can do much more than this. And that's why I think we might be a chance next week. But yeah, a good close game. Two teams that won't make the finals. But I don't know, just a good close match of football. It doesn't always have to be Pies and whoever they play on TV does it. So yeah, great job. Obviously, Lions, Dockers, Saints and Swans had the bye. And then, um, yeah, we'll be playing next week. Uh, and we'll do a little preview of that on the preview podcast, which should be out Thursday for you guys. So just a quick round review. Collingwood's still at the top of the ladder. Um, we are sitting 17th. I have a good feeling that we're going to get a few wins to the back half of the year. I reckon we could get up to about 15th on the ladder. Um, we'll be in the bottom four. Let's not try and get too carried away. But um, that North Melbourne Hawthorne game, start setting your calendars now, guys. Marvel Stadium, I think it's on a Sunday. We all need to be getting down there and rallying this team to a win. I want to absolutely destroy the Hawks. If Clark goes back, then especially, let's absolutely destroy this mob because they deserve it. They absolutely deserve it. Well, thank you for listening again, guys. I really do appreciate it. Um, another long one, but you guys seem to love them. Thank you again to Marnie for coming on and having a chat. And yeah, hopefully we can go down to Tassie next week and get a win uh, over the Giants down there. So thank you once again. Facebook, Instagram, please follow along, get your thoughts read out, get involved, and we'll talk to you very, very soon, guys. Thank you very much. Kanga, kanga, kanga. Woo. No, I'm not doing it. Thanks for listening to the Further North Podcast. We'll be back next week with more great North chat. See you then, Bruce fans.